tonight on the final play. Huge open. And he's able to get past the secondary and take off. Of the, game. the Saints run away from the Giants and walk off winners in the Meadowlands. I was proud of how we played defensively and I thought we played one of our better complimentary games. We've got reaction from the team and analysis from Deuce McAllister. Plus, LSU opens up the offense in a route of Ole Miss. And like I told you guys a couple weeks ago, I think the offense is getting ready to take off. I thought we took a stride tonight. We're recapping a winning weekend for all of our college football teams, plus a preview of the Pelican season as they get the preseason underway tonight. From Fox Fake Sports, this is the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built Ford Tough, and Nissan. Two road games and two Saints victories. Welcome in to the final play. I'm Chris Hagan. The black and gold took over in New York, and it was a complete game effort from a defense that finally stopped giving up the explosive plays to another gem of a game from Alvin Kamara. It was not only a win, but a big step in the right direction for a team that believes they have a championship roster. Juan Kincaid has the recap from the Meadowlands. Saints playing and winning in New Jersey's Meadowlands has never come easy. 2006 was the last time they did it against the Giants, and today's meeting began true to form. Summing up the first 30 minutes of this game, too easy. Missed opportunities, and Will Lutz's leg tell the entire story. The Giants opened the scoring when they took their opening drive, 75 yards and 10 plays. Eli Manning finding Sterling Shepard for the two-yard score for a 7-0 New York lead. As for those opportunities for the Saints, between the 20s, the offense wasn't that bad, as witnessed by a couple of their first half drives. 15 plays, 51 yards, and later a 9-play, 69-yard drive. The thing those two drives had in common, a costly penalty or bad execution inside the Giants' red zone. It's why the Saints had to settle for field goals. You know, I felt like the uh, first half was tough sledding a little bit. You know, it couldn't really... Couldn't really cross the finish line, you know. We we, we got got a couple opportunities down there in the red zone and uh, and came away with field goals every time, which you know you'd like to have touchdowns. Meanwhile, we wondered how the Saints' defense would respond following their poor performance in Atlanta last week. Their second takeaway of the season happened on the Giants' third possession of the game, when much maligned P.J. Williams hit on Wayne Gowan Jr., knocked the ball loose into the hands of Marshawn Lattimore, who was a Manning juke away from scoring a touchdown. Instead, the Saints had to settle for a field goal. They led 12-7 at the half, but their lead should have been much more. Perhaps that's why the Saints got back to basics in the third quarter. Decked out in their color rush jerseys, the gold and white rushed their way to their first touchdown. Alva Kamara in from nine yards out. That put some pad on the scoreboard. Saints up 19-7. Yeah, it starts from the head. You know, Drew, Drew, Drew comes in the huddle and just says one play at a time. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a sense of calmness, you know, in the huddle. And, you know, we, we know when, we, when we're executing at a high level that, you know, nobody can stop us. With that cushion, the Saints defense picked up the pressure on Manning, getting to him three times with Demario Davis doing the honors twice in a stadium he used to call home. That's one of our goals is, uh, you know, get out the quarterback, get hits on the quarterback, you know, each and every week, we get hits on the quarterback, get out the field on third down, create takeaways. You know, I think I think we followed through on our goals today. We talked about how the Giants, you know, want to be bigger and tougher than everybody, and we had to be out physical in this game. We did just that. From then on out, it was all about the Saints killing off the game, and what better way to do that than putting together a 14-play, 73-yard scoring drive, one in which they converted third downs on one, six, seven, and nine yards capped off by an Alva Kamara four-yard score, and the Saints put the game on ice up 26 to 10. <laughs> or so they thought. The Giants went hurry up and cashed in 10 plays 75 yards later, with Saquon Barkley diving in from a yard out. The Saints lead just eight. And then things got interesting when Ted Ginn Jr. nearly botched the kickoff return. The Saints had to set up from their own three-yard line. No worries. Alvin Kamara's got this. 49-yard touchdown, and that was that. Saints win it 33-18. Lose our first one, then win three in a row. So we've got a little streak going here. But three and one, I think, in the first quarter of the season. Um, you know, listen, I, I feel like we're getting better and better each week, and that's, what's, that's what is most important to me. I thought we played one of our better complimentary games. Time of possession, turnovers, all of, all of those things kind of went in our favor. And... You know, when you do that, you're probably going to win more than you lose. 
Joined now by Saints Hall of Famer Deuce McAllister and our Saints analyst. At the end of the day, it's about getting a victory in a place where you've really struggled to win games since 2006. You've struggled here for some reason. You've played well at spots at times, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's a W. But, you know, you can go back in that film, you look at it, and, you know, you sh probably should have been up two touchdowns in the first half. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Alvin Kamara catch, it hits his hand, maybe not a perfect throw from Taysom, but it hit his, it hit his hands. Uh, you talk about Ben Watson being able to bring one in that he catches it, but it, when it goes to the ground, the defender rolls it out from him. I think they were 0 for 4 in the red zone, and that's something that they have to clean up. One for eight on third down. Mm -hmm area of uh, not necessarily concern, but where they have to get better at. We came into this game thinking Drew Brees, oh, 418 yards from getting the all-time passing yards record, passing Peyton Manning. He got 218 in this game. It was a complimentary football game for this team where they couldn't depend on Brees to get the ball in the end zone, but they found the way through the running game. Giants brought just enough pressure. Giants brought pressure at different times from different places. Uh, Lennon Collins hadn't played well up into this game. He was a difference maker for him. Thought they did a really good job of taking Jenkins, uh, wherever Mike Thomas went and then rolling safety coverage. So there was other players that had to step up. At times they did a pretty good job, but I'm telling you, you can go back and look at it and they're a player away from really blowing this game open. We talked in early in the week about, okay, this is gonna be the best running back the Saints defense has faced all year. They're number one in the league, three yards per carry. And they gave up 65 yards to this Giants offense. 44 yards to Saquon Barkley. I'd say they showed something today. I think they definitely showed something. Outside of the big run that he had in the third quarter, he couldn't get anything. Yeah. I thought penetration-wise, whether it was Stallworth, whether it was Tyler Davidson, mm -hmm. you know, defensive ends, you knew what you were going to get from Cam. Davenport had a big play yes, tackle for a loss. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, a uh, nice inside move by him to be able to tackle Barkley. I mean, but for them to shut him down in that manner, you're pleased. Taysom Hill. Let's talk about Taysom Hill for a second because I don't think we've seen him used more in the first three games than you saw him used today. Sean Payton said we saw a lot of looks that we liked to get him an opportunity. My question is, did they use him a little bit too much because it seemed like the offense was out of rhythm early on? I don't think so. I okay. think what they were doing with him, he may have been in in certain plays, but he wasn't a focal point. But when he did go in for the read option look, you know, I think maybe once or twice he should have given it, but he was still able to make a play or two. But you know, once he did give it, that defense was just frozen. So so the next, you know, it's the evolution of that play is to be able to create a throw. We did see him line up and throw a play, but it wasn't off of a read option. But I think he did well. I think he did really well. The last two drives of the game really uh, signified how this team won this game. 14-play, 73-yard drive, touchdown. Six-play, 97-yard drive after Ted Ginn bumbles the ball down near his goal line. That really kind of summed up this whole game for the Saints in the second half, didn't it? Teddy kind of panicked there. Yeah, he, he, can, he, he, he doesn't even have to catch that ball because if it's one yard in the end, zone take a knee I mean so he kind of panicked there fumbled the ball you have to go 97 and the Saints were fine with there because hey look they felt like that whether they had to run the ball or throw it they were going to get first downs and that's what they ended up doing but you know it's interesting to see this team kind of change its identity where they can pound you mm -hmm. and not have to rely on the big play to be able to move the football next week they'll get Mark Ingram back Drew Brees was the first to say I'm happy to have him back this team may not change how they play but it's gonna be a different looking team next week won't well it? with the emotion and the personnel that they use they can use him in so many different ways and it takes a lot off of Alvin now I mean yeah. because he doesn't have to be the traditional running back that he's been have, having to be first four games real quickly next week Drew Brees going for the record he's 200 yards shy he might get it on Monday Night Football I think they play pretty well on Monday night don't they get, get your ticket <laughs> if you if you haven't you're yeah. gonna miss it that is gonna be a hot ticket that's Deuce McAllister Saints Hall of Famer let's go back to the studio thank you guys Deuce will be right back with us tomorrow to bring you all of the day after analysis starting with his black and gold rewind at 8 a.m. two-minute drill at 5 and then the black and gold review show at 10 35 Still to come, Demario Davis returned to the Big Apple and delivered his biggest game as a Saint. Sean Fazan looks at the inspired performance coming up. You're watching the final play. Hey, I know you, man. I know. Hey, hey, well, up, for real. Real for real. hey. I like what you're doing, bro. LSU and Ole Miss is a rivalry shared not only between two schools, but between two positions, the Rebels wide receivers and the Tigers defensive backs. Each has sent a number of players from their ranks into big roles in the NFL, but Saturday night it was LSU winning that battle. 
Garland Gillen reports. Second and 15 to throw. Shot down the sideline. And it is intercepted. For the throw. Taking a shot. The LSU Tigers delivered a total team effort on both sides of the ball to deliver a blowout win over Ole Miss by the score of 45-16. The Tigers maintained their number five ranking in the AP poll and kept the doubters quiet for another week. We blocked out the noise and we we did what we wanted to do. I mean, that's, that's I mean, we played five games. That's the best record we could have, right? Um, credit the coaching staff. I mean, all the late nights they have. Um, all the players watching film, taking notes, making sure that we're all on the same page, have incredible communication both offensively, defensively, and special teams. Um, guys are just working their butts off, man, and, and that's what it takes to have a really good team. We haven't played a, a complete game yet. We have to remain hungry. Uh, we have to play our best to beat anybody. Uh, every team in the SEC is going to be a challenge. We know it is. Uh, we're going to enjoy this win. One player who's no doubt enjoying this W is quarterback Joe Burrow. The Ohio State transfer threw for three touchdowns and ran for one score. I think we're really st getting to start or starting to get a feel of each other. Offensive line, receivers, me, running backs. Um, like I told you guys a couple weeks ago, I think the offense is getting ready to take off. I thought we took a stride tonight. Joe can do some things, but we're going to have to get better on the offensive line to protect. Now, I think that's where we've got to make a decision what we can and what we can't do. I think Joe can make the throws. I know he can. I know he can make the decisions. I know he can scramble. Whether or not we can protect long enough for him, I think that's an improvement we need to make. We feel confident with him there, and, and he does an incredible job for us. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of how confident he is and, and how well adjusted he is to this offense and the, and the little sideline wrinkles we put in. Um, and we're doing a great, doing a great job keeping him protected, um, and he's doing a great job making him pay. Tight end Foster Morrow likens Joe Burrow's game to Baker Mayfield. He said he has an energy that ignites the entire team. In Baton Rouge, Garland Gill and Fox 8 Sports. Thank you, Garland. As a result of the big win, LSU remains fifth in the AP poll. They're behind Alabama, who destroyed UL Lafayette, Georgia, Ohio State after that big win at Penn State, and a very fortunate Clemson team. Others to keep an eye on in the poll, Auburn still in the top 10 at 4-1, and one. 12th ranked Central Florida, who's forgotten how to lose. A surprisingly undefeated Kentucky at 13. Miami ranked 17th. And the Tigers' next opponent, 22nd ranked Florida, who they'll face in Gainesville on Saturday afternoon. Meanwhile, uptown, Friday night turned out to be quite the party for the Green Wave. As 14.5 point underdogs to Memphis, they shocked the American Athletic Conference with their best performance of this year and maybe of the past few years. To say the least, they ran the ball right down the Tigers' throats. Darius Bradwell led the way with 19 carries for 153 yards. In fact, it was his 53-yard touchdown that gave Tulane the lead they would hold on to for good. As for the only touchdown pass of the game, that came from LSU transfer Justin McMillan in the third quarter after Jonathan Banks briefly left the contest. A 51-yarder to Darnell Mooney. The wave improved to 2-3 and three and picked up some much-needed momentum to get their season back on track. It was a similar story down in Thibodeau. The Colonels put a beat down on Lamar for their second straight conference win. And as usual, it was a number of our former Fox 8 Football Friday standouts from the area that led the way. Trailing in the second quarter, Dejon Dixon catches the touchdown from Chase 4K to put them ahead 20-17. to Then later in the second, Julian Gums, the former De La Salle quarterback, proving he's got what it takes to be a collegiate running back. This 68-yard touchdown, part of a 10-carry, 152-yard day as the Colonels down the Cardinals 50-27. to <laughs> Wrapping it up in Hammond, it was the Chase and Virgil show for the Lions. He didn't waste any time finding the speedster, Austin Mitchell, behind the entire defense. A huge touchdown hookup gave them an early lead, and Virgil wasn't done. A little bit later, Virgil targets C.J. Turner in the end zone. And if it wasn't Virgil getting it done, it was the other quarterback, Lorenzo Nunez. He finds Paydirt on the keeper. They took a 21-point lead into the fourth quarter and would hang on to win 24-17. to That said, let's take a look at a jam-packed Week 6 schedule. 
Tulane will try to make it two in a row at undefeated Cincinnati. LSU takes yet another trip to Gainesville in a top 25 showdown. Southeastern also heads west. They'll be at Incarnate Word. Nichols travels to Northwestern State. And UL Lafayette gets into conference play against Texas State. Up next, high school highlights and our first glimpse of the Pelicans in the preseason. Our catch of the week comes from none other than the ageless Ben Watson. He comes up with the diving effort in the third quarter en route to the Saints' first touchdown of the day. It was his only catch of the day, but it was a big one. As for Drew Brees, he's now just 201 yards from passing Peyton Manning for the NFL all-time passing yards record. The Saints spent a lot of money in draft picks to upgrade their defense over the offseason, but so far, not much return on investment. That is until today, when they showed up in a big way to face the Giants. One of the biggest contributors was one of the biggest free agent acquisitions who's very familiar with the Meadowlands. Sean Fazan reports. As a member of the Jets for five seasons of his career, MetLife Stadium was home to DeMario Davis. And perhaps that's why he felt quite comfortable there Sunday when he returned to face the Giants. Saints Blitzen, and they got Eli back at the 33. I mean, it was a big game for us, uh, offensively and defensively. Our, t our coach just said, you know what I'm saying, it was a bad game for us, so we wanted to be physical. It showed. On a day where the Saints defense rose to the occasion, Davis may have shined brightest. He had his best game in black and gold with 11 tackles, two for loss, and two crucial sacks, including one that stopped the Giants' fourth quarter drive and inspired a faith-based celebration from Davis. Oh, that's uh, put, it's Jesus on the cross. You know, I'm a believer, and everything is to the glory of God, you know, the glory of Christ. So I just want to be an imitation of him. So carry my cross every day just like Jesus. All in all, it was the kind of effort the Saints envisioned when they made Davis their marquee free agent acquisition this offseason. But after the game, Davis wasn't up much for talking about his individual stats, but rather repeated the mantra of his defense as a whole. Defensively, I mean, our goals are each game, stop the run, stop the pass, create takeaways, get out the field on third down, be good in the red zone. Our goals didn't change, you know, stop the run, stop the pass, get out the field on third down, create takeaways. Uh, we did that pretty good today. The message clearly resonated, especially with Davis. With the Saints, I'm Sean Fazand for the final play. Still to come, a triumphant weekend for our local college football teams, including surprising offensive bursts from LSU and Tulane. We'll recap it all next. You're watching the final play. Our play of the week is a testament to playing through the soggy conditions Friday. Newman's defense stout all night, but Bobby Moore showed flexibility and athleticism here. Diving for an interception, all part of an impressive greeny routing of Lusher to stay perfect on the season. Meanwhile, our players of the week represent a wide viewing area. From the North Shore, Mandeville running back Zahn Diaz totaling 306 yards this week. De La Salle's Montrell Johnson did that and then some with 343 rushing yards and five touchdowns, a Cavaliers school record. And Terrebonne's Chaz Ward in their big win over Hanville rushing for three touchdowns. Head over to fox8live.com slash player to get your votes in. How about some Pelicans preseason action? Julius Randle and Alfred Payton making their debuts with the team, both in the starting lineup. Frank Jackson also on the floor for the first time after missing last year injured. He knocks down a three, makes it 21-20 Bulls. Later in the first, Randle making his presence felt. The bucket and the foul, he'd make the free throw to put the Pels up 26-25. But let's not forget about the guys who run the show. Drew Holiday to Anthony Davis with the alley-oop. That is what we're used to seeing, though it would be Chicago pulling out the preseason win 128 to 116. As for the season outlook as a whole, while the Pelicans are on more solid ground than a year ago, with Anthony Davis's future seemingly in the balance, this will be another pivotal year for the franchise. They're hoping that they've pulled the right strings and added the right pieces to take a step or two forward.
After a playoff appearance last season, the expectations are much higher for the Pelicans as they should be. But while head coach Alvin Gentry is embracing them and ready to take this team forward, he also knows the challenge of going from good to great and the slim margin of error they have in the Western Conference. You know, you got to have some luck and then uh, you got to have consistent play, you know, throughout the season, you know, with very little, you know, dip in the, in the performance. And that's where we're trying to get to uh, as, a, as a team and as a, as a franchise. Most of the, the elite teams in this league are pretty elite defensively, and that's where we got to try to get to. They certainly have a great foundation to become an elite defensive team when you look at Drew Holiday, arguably the best two-way guard in the game, and Anthony Davis, who rarely meets a shot he can't block. And when you look at the team effort and commitment to that side of the floor, especially during the playoffs last year, you can see the potential. Now what's on some of the newest Pelicans, Alfred Payton and Julius Randle, to build on what they accomplished last season. You know, I know people think they lost it or something like that, but I'm excited to get out there and show, and show uh, you know, I still could uh, defend at a high level. Uh, especially with people you know around me that you know take defense very seriously. Randall, meanwhile, could also be the key to some very interesting lineups where they move Nikola Miritich to the three, have Randall play the four, and Anthony Davis as the five. Since they can all take the ball off the rim and push it up the floor, it would fit very well into Gentry's offense that he wants to see run even faster. That'll be fun. You know, everybody talks about like the small ball stuff and. Uh, small ball fives and all this type of stuff and I feel like we it's, I'm in a unique situation with bigs who are you know very tall and athletic and can play with guards still um, so I feel like it'll be it'll definitely be a fun you know rotation or combination of guys with, with us three on the court. But will it be effective enough for the Pelicans not only to get back to where they were last year but to take a step forward as well? The West only gets better with LeBron James in the mix and others on the rise, which leads Gentry to believe that the playoff race will be another dogfight. You may have to win eight out of your last ten games to even have an opportunity to be in the playoffs. And I, I, I think the separation between one and eight is going to be a lot less than it has been in the past because I think there's the parity is becoming more and more apparent you know, every year. And now heading toward the prime of AD's career, where he's now declaring he's the best player in the league, each passing season without a championship, or at least progress, will be that much tougher for the superstar to stomach. The pressure is on for the Pelicans. It's that time of the year where there's always more we wish we could get on the final play, but for now, that will do it from us here at Fox 8. For everyone here that's contributed to tonight's show, have a great night. Fox NFL Game Day Prime is next. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the final play.